Good night, everyone. Um, for those of you who were on last night, sorry about the poor connection. Uh, so tonight we're going to speak about ovarian aging, the effect of age on egg quality, etc., and how that impacts fertility chances and IVF. My name is Professor Hayden Homer. I am UQ's inaugural chair in reproductive medicine. Um, I am one of four CREI subspecialists in Queensland and the only one who is also accredited in the UK. Um, my expertise is egg quality. Um, we published some world leading research, some of which was recently on Channel 7. Um, my lab is the only lab to study egg quality in Queensland and I'm sitting right now in my office in the university actually because the connection is more stable so hopefully we'll get through this tonight without hiccups. Alright, just a bit of background about female age and egg quality. Um, it's the biology of the ovary that really makes age so important when it comes to human pregnancy. So women are born with one to two million eggs and they don't get any new ones throughout postnatal life. This means that their eggs get older with them. The other important point to note is that eggs contribute virtually everything to the embryo. So egg quality is rate limiting for pregnancy success and egg quality goes down with age and that's why pregnancy success and the success of treatments like IVF etc track very closely with female age. <clears throat> now what a lot of people probably don't realize is that that decline in egg quality starts to impact fertility quite early at around 30 years and especially after 35. So it's about two to three decades earlier than other organ systems in the body like liver, heart, etc. start to fail. Um, it is just a unique phenomenon and um, it is one of the, for us anyway, one of the most intriguing facets of, of aging. Um, just so you know, age doesn't really affect men as much because they retain something in their testis called stem cells, which means that they can produce sperm throughout their adult life and in fact they produce about 10 to 100 million sperm per day. So there are really two extremes in, extreme ends of biology, men and women, in terms of how age impacts uh, pregnancy success. Um, in terms of you know what that success rate means in practice, well for women under 35 undergoing IVF, um, they'll con we expect that they'll conceive within at least at least within four cycles of treatment. So in other words, a 25% per cycle chance. At age 45, women require on average 85 cycles to conceive. So it's, you know, you're looking at very low success rates in the 40s and especially above 42. Um, what else? Uh, in terms of what can you do about egg quality, well, there isn't any treatment really proven to reverse poor egg quality, although we've published the most promising treatment so far. It was trialed in mice and it's not yet been um, shown to work uh, in humans, although those clinical trials were hoping to start. So I have a question about what's the best age to freeze eggs. Um, and on the basis of what I've said so far, uh, the best age to freeze eggs is the age at which you get the best return on your investment and that undoubtedly is the early 30s or younger. Um, age also affects the numbers of eggs that we can obtain when we do an egg freeze cycle. So in an ideal world you want to get large numbers of good quality eggs 
and your best option for getting that is in the early 30s, late 20s. Um, by the time you get to your late 30s, the number of eggs you need to freeze to obtain the same chance of pregnancy is twice as many as if you're in your early 30s. Uh, in terms of what, I have another question here, what does egg freezing involve? Well, it involves an IVF type procedure where injections are given to grow follicles in the ovaries. The follicles contain the eggs and that is given for about 10 to 14 days and in that time you'll have about two to three ultrasound scans to monitor follicle development. <clears throat> Once the follicles are big enough, and by that we're talking about somewhere close to two centimeters in size, we'd administer what's called a trigger injection. The trigger causes the eggs inside the follicles to mature, so that when we do the egg pickup, which is usually about 36 hours after the trigger, we'll obtain mature eggs. It's critical to get mature eggs because immature eggs can't be fertilized, and we'll only freeze the mature eggs. Um, the technique for freezing eggs, uh, the best technique right now is known as vitrification. It's the least damaging to the eggs and allows the best survival post-thaw. Uh, roughly how many eggs you'd need to freeze? Well, if you're under 35, you're looking to obtain, you're looking for the potential of obtaining three blastocyst stage embryos. And to obtain that, you typically need at least 10 eggs. So there's quite a bit of drop off between the actual eggs you have frozen and the usable embryos you can obtain. <clears throat> so if you're over 38, you're now looking at double that number of eggs to freeze, which is about 20. Uh, and each blastocyst, good quality for someone under 35, has about a 36% chance of pregnancy. So three blastocysts, 10 eggs under 35 will give you close to 100% chance of pregnancy. Um, the egg pickup is the most involved bit of the egg freezing process because it involves passing a needle into the ovary. That is most often done under general anesthetic, although it can be done under sedation. It lasts about 30 minutes. It's quite a short procedure. The risks are usually minimal. Um, one of the things about egg freezing is that it's if it's done to preserve fertility, in other words, there's not a medical indication, it's not typically covered by Medicare. So it's a complete out-of-pocket cost for it. Uh, so that's egg freezing. There's another question about, um, is it best to freeze eggs or embryos? Uh, embryos, undoubtedly because you're much further down the path towards pregnancy. So you kind of know a bit more about what you have in store. Um, what I mean is if you freeze eggs, there are a number of steps following thaw that are a bit unknown or difficult to predict. The first one is how many eggs will survive the thaw. If you are young and the egg quality is good, it might be about 80%. The next one is how many eggs will actually fertilize. That may as well, might as well be around 60 to 70 percent. And then you don't know how many will develop properly in the lab post-fertilization. When you freeze embryos, you've gone through all that, those stages and you're really freezing something that can be thawed and transferred straight away. Um, so freezing embryos is undoubtedly your best, um, your better option assuming you are, you're in a stable relationship, or you might choose <coughs> to fertilize the eggs with donor sperm prior to freezing, and then freeze uh, donor sperm inseminated uh, embryos. <coughs> um, In terms of uh, treatment for, in terms of from the GP referral pathway point of view, uh, female age is really a critical driver for deciding how quickly to refer. Um, 
so for women who are young, early 30s, there's a bit of a longer window of opportunity. Um, and typically, you might refer after 12 months of trying. Uh, but that assumes that everything is seems quite normal, and that is that cycles are regular. There is no obvious history that would suggest damage to the tubes uh, or damage to sperm. Under those circumstances, you would expect that 80% of people would have conceived by 12 months. If you haven't conceived by 12 months, your chances of success really drop off after that to under 2% per month. And it suggests that something is probably wrong and you need investigation and treatment. For women above 35 years, the, um, the, the, you, the, the sort of urgency is a bit greater and you'd probably not wait longer than six months before referring those patients on for specialist opinion and investigation. Uh, so female age is really critical. Some of the most, um, I suppose, distressing patient, patients you come across are those who've been sort of kept um, trying for quite long and then turn up to your office at around 38 years or even 40 years, you know, after which, you know, their best opportunity is really passed. Um, there's a question here. When do I think people should give up on IVF? Um, look, IVF, I think one of the problems with IVF is that, well, it's not a problem. One of the issues with IVF in some places in Australia is that it's a bit of a hobby for some doctors. And it's not really being interpreted thoroughly to use the information to guide patients uh, expertly. So when patients should give up depends really on how their IVF cycle has gone. By that I mean how many eggs are we getting? How are the ovaries responding to stimulation? Are we getting embryos? Are they dividing reasonably well in the lab? When all of that is happening and you can see that there isn't a major problem you know, your decision about when you give up really is down to when might you expect a pregnancy statistically, and that's going to change with female age. Um, so it's really an individual decision. There is no clear number that you would give up on. There are patients who IVF just does not suit, and that is those are women who, for example, almost never get an embryo created either because they always produce immature eggs or very few or no eggs at all. So it's important to remember that if someone doesn't do well with IVF, that doesn't mean that they can't conceive with a step back down to something like intrauterine insemination. Because eggs that don't do well in the lab, which is a very stressful situation, might do well in the body. Okay, so that's just something to bear in mind. It's, ne it's not always IVF and you keep flogging this, this horse, you know. It's, it, it is about working out what's best for that particular patient. Um, so side effects of hormones um, is very individual. Um, some, most women have very little side effects. The commonest one I, I find is tiredness patients um, comment on feeling tired. Very few people have severe mood swings or anything like that. It's usually over before most patients know it. Um, I'd say tiredness is the commonest one. Um, sometimes there are local side effects to some injections, like the antagonist in particular can cause a local sort of very mild allergic reaction. Uh, but 10 days of simulation, it's egg pickup before you know it. Um, a lot of the, the side effects tend to come with the progesterone phase of treatment, which is after egg pickup. The progesterone is quite irritant, especially crinone, uh, to the vaginal wall and can cause quite a lot of vaginal soreness. That's not uncommon. 
and that's when a lot of people have some of the mood effects in the in the post egg pickup phase uh, lifestyle to improve egg quality so the question is can I do anything in my lifestyle to improve egg quality or fertility chances well the key things to do are the things that will not worsen your egg quality there's nothing in your lifestyle that will improve it above its best level but what you can certainly do things that make it worse and one of the things that make egg quality reduce egg quality is ob obesity so obesity is thought to reduce IVF success rates by at least 50% in some cases so weight control exercise that's beneficial um, avoid alcohol and smoking not that any of those really impact egg quality but they do impact any early pregnancy um, so it's mostly about weight there's nothing there's no magic diet um, it's just about balanced diet control weight stay as fit as you can um, yeah and that's that's the sort of lifestyle issues Uh, there are a lot of supplements out there as well and a lot of them provided by naturopaths that propose to improve egg quality uh, I can tell you now it's not based on very good science and um, very often when I see some of these um, recipes they have the wrong dose that didn't wasn't in, used in whatever few trials were involved so just be wary of those um, that promise things that don't seem to be real um, so I have a question here about um, an IVF cycle um, with nine follicles okay so if it this was a question about antral follicle count that was nine that's quite good uh, a low antral follicle count is like two to three um, so poor is poor responses under three eggs now antral follicles are a stage of follicle development where there's a little sack of fluid in the follicle so I scan all my patients on day two of their cycle because I want to know how many antral follicles they have before I start stimulation the reason is this group of follicles with the sac of fluid in it that you can see on scan are the only ones with receptors to respond to the injections so by counting these follicles it gives me a guide as to the sort of number of eggs I can reasonably expect so if I see nine antral follicles at the start of a cycle that's reasonably good I'd be looking at on a really good day nine eggs and as we know well you may not know but the sweet spot for IVF in terms of egg number and success is somewhere in the region of 8 to 15 the reality about IVF is that the more eggs you get the more likely you are to get pregnant plain and simple there is no such thing as too many eggs more eggs means more cumulative chance of pregnancy end of story you know full stop that's that's been shown now by large studies coming out of the Spanish groups <coughs> uh, so with nine follicles that's quite good you'd be looking at a good egg yield if your cycle is stimulated properly and trigger timing etc is done meticulously what do I think might be a reason for embryos that have divided well but died after three days and failed to reach blastocyst so this is something I see a lot that is classic poor that is a classic egg quality issue remember eggs contribute virtually everything to the embryo so embryo division in the lab and this is where really drilling down into the embryology sheet is key to work out how to strategize your IVF so if on an IVF cycle all of your embryos are dying at cleavage stage you clearly do not wait till blastocyst to do an embryo transfer 
because egg quality is not great, the embryos are dividing, but not beyond the cleavage stage. So your strategy is transfer at cleavage stage and probably multiple embryo transfer because remember with with low egg quality in particular, your objective is to get back as many embryos into the cavity as possible. If your embryos aren't getting to blastocysts, you won't have embryos to freeze. So you won't have another shot of these embryos in a freeze and thaw cycle. So it means using your embryos, maximizing their use when fresh. And the way to do that is obviously transfer before they die, so in cle at cleavage stage and transfer more than one because the chance of both of them implanting is obviously quite low. But the increased chance you get of pregnancy if you put more than one back outweighs that risk. It's beneficial, right? Um, so too often I see patients having cycles. There's this notion that you have to get to blastocyst to get a transfer. That's simply not true. Um, and if you don't get to blastocyst, the embryo would not have made a pregnancy. Again, not true. There's no way you can do that study because you'd have to transfer the same embryo twice. It's simply not possible to know that. The one thing I can tell you, and this is something I tell my patients, the only guarantee I can give you in IVF is that if I don't transfer an embryo, you definitely won't get pregnant. All right, so my objective in a cycle is always to look very closely at embryo development following egg pickup because that's your first hint, that's your first clear hint of egg quality apart from female age. So you need to really have a close look at what the day three embryo looks like and make a call on when you do embryo transfer. Question here, what is the percentage rate from five embryos reaching blastocyst if not reached there by day five? Um, I don't, well, not sure I understand the question, um, but depending on the lab you work in, and I've certainly found since moving to Queensland that there are a lot of embryos get to blastocysts by day six. So it depends on how the embryos are tracking. If they've made it, if they by cleavage stage they had a nice number of cells, so six to ten by day three, uh, and then went on to morula, and then are an early blastocyst stage by day five, or even morula, there's a reasonably good chance of having, uh, if it's five embryos at that stage on day five, having a fully expanded blastocyst by day six. So there are a large proportion of embryos that don't get to blastocyst fully expanded by day five. So some of this you need to understand how the blastocyst grading is done. And they, the embryologist won't freeze a blastocyst that's not expanded. These are the grade one and two blastocysts. They need to be fully expanded so that they can grade the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. That's when you end up with a grading like 3AA, etc. The three means a fully expand, uh, an expanded blastocyst. Four is fully expanded. One and two are not expanded. Um, I'm not sure I answered that question completely, but there are quite a few of the day five embryos that if they're at early blastocyst or morula will get to full blastocyst expansion by day six. What are my thoughts on someone testing positive to lupus? Um, so if this is lupus anticoagulant, so you know one of the antiphospholipid antibodies, these patients I treat with clexane and aspirin. Um, so there's something called antiphospholipid syndrome, which you probably know about. Um, it's the combination of recurrent miscarriage and the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. And the three antiphospholipid antibodies we test for are lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibody, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1. If you test positive for one of these antibodies and you have recurrent miscarriage, you should be treated with clexane and aspirin. 
So three IVF losses with lupus anticoagulant I would cover with clexane and aspirin. Uh, can using Luveris injection improve egg quality during IVF? No. Um, by the time you start an IVF cycle, the eggs in the follicles that you're dealing with are no longer growing. The egg grows for about six weeks to three months before becoming part of an antral follicle. So when we see an antral follicle at the start of a cycle, the egg inside is not doing anything anymore. It's fully grown. We can't really influence its quality anymore. That window is gone. Okay? Um, so Luveris really is trying to add in LH in some women we think are deficient in androgens in particular. It's usually used with the older ovary. Um, the evidence that it does a whole lot isn't great. Um, but I do use LH containing formulations in, on some occasions, very not that often. What's more important is getting your FSH formulation right. And some women don't respond well to recombinant FSH. That's FSH that's made in the lab like Gonalef. And they do better on a human FSH like Menopure. Menopure happens to have LH in it. But I use Menopure not really for the LH but for the FSH structure. Um, so the question about Luberus and egg, egg quality is no, it doesn't improve egg quality. It might affect follicular response and therefore potentially egg numbers, uh, but that is debatable. Uh, what does the research um, say in regard to DHA, DHA and egg quality? DHA is a very good example of the one treatment targeted to egg quality that has been used properly. And when I say used properly, all the trials that look at DHEA have studied DHEA use in an IVF cycle after it's been used for six weeks. In other words, it's been used during the phase that the egg was growing up until the site time to stimulate treatment. So those eggs have grown in the presence of DHEA and would have had that influence their egg quality. The evidence with DHEA is messy. We've actually just meta-analyzed this data. Uh, and you see, with DHEA, it's been used, the focus with DHEA has been on poor responders. Poor responders refer to women who produce less than three eggs. That's a numbers issue. It's not a quality issue. Number and quality are two different things. So the question with the HEA, most studies posed was, could it improve egg numbers? We've actually analyzed it specifically asking whether it can improve egg quality, and it looks like it can. It's not, it's statistically significant, but it's not a, it's not a huge game changer. If you're going to use the HEA, uh, the dose is 25 milligrams three times a day for at least six weeks before your IVF cycle. That's the critical thing. Uh, using it once you've started simulation is far too late. <clears throat> okay, there's a long message here. Um, someone saying thank you, you're welcome. Um, Okay. All right. I think I've covered all these questions. Unless there's anything more. If you wanted to read about any of these things, in particular recurrent miscarriage, I wrote a paper and it's available on in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Obs and Gynae and it's open access. So it's free to access. Just to point out that recurrent miscarriage is different from infertility. So IVF is a treatment for infertility, which is difficulty conceiving. Managing recurrent miscarriage is different. 
these women conceive, they just lose the pregnancy. Uh, and IVF is not a treatment for recurrent miscarriage. Uh, how risky is it for someone with PCOS to aim for a lot of eggs without overstimulation? PCOS is a difficult one to manage. There is no, there is no middle road with PCS. If you go too low, you'll end up doing ovulation induction and you'll get one or two eggs. I'd much rather stimulate the ovaries properly, get lots of eggs, freeze the embryos with an agonist trigger so you don't develop hyperstimulation. So there's a very safe way to stimulate PCO ovaries properly, get large numbers of eggs, and completely avoid hyperstimulation. You do, however, need to freeze all the embryos. That's the one downside, but from my point of view, I'd much rather get lots of eggs and multiple embryos to work with than one or two eggs. <clears throat> Your cumulative success rate from lots of eggs is going to far outstrip one or two eggs. Uh, a slow responder to IVF drugs, uh, 400, would a long downreg cycle be better? Day five, that's 278. Yeah, not really. The long down, so when you have poor, if you have poor ovarian reserve, anything that suppresses FSH and LH for too long is not good for follicle recruitment. Um, so an antagonist cycle for a lot of people is, act is very, you know, you can delay your, the introduction of your antagonist so that you have mostly FSH stimulation. Once you introduce something that blocks GnRH, um, then you are going to block your own endogenous FSH and LH, and that's going to reduce your stimulation. So I don't really believe in, you know, overly sort of massaging the stimulation. The stimulation, it's not so much the drug you use or how you throw it around. It's meticulous monitoring, timing the trigger, and maximizing your egg pickup. All the other things that you see thrown around, like we'll use this drug, that drug, whatever, really doesn't add a whole lot. You need to get your FSH, the type of FSH you use, correct. Some people, like I said, don't respond to recombinant FSH very well and they may need a combination of recombinant and human FSH. That's really important. Um, IVF is, is about maximizing the eggs you have available to you. All the dosing and that sort of thing really doesn't add a whole lot. I mean, you can get the dosing really wrong, don't get me wrong, but um, it's really maximizing what you have in front of you. How do you start IVF? Um, well, once you've set up, you've seen your specialist, IVF is very easy to get going. On day one of bleed, we get things kicked off. Your day two scan, well, for me, I scan on day two because I want to see your antral follicle count before simulation. FSH starts on day three, and then from your fifth day of stimulation, you want to get your first idea of how the ovaries are responding. Have we hit the dose right? Are we getting there? And your first hint by day five, what you're looking for is follicles in the region of eight to 10. Once follicles get to 10, they're likely to keep growing. Your endometrial thickness is a good hint as to how follicle thickness is, follicle growth is going because endometrial thickness is a direct readout of estrogen. And estrogen is coming from only one place, follicle development. Um, and then, obviously, the stimulation will continue for another five days. You'll have an, another couple scans when you then time trigger and egg pick up. So starting IVF, very easy. Um, 39-year-old patient uh, doing IVF. Since March, eight eggs, then three, then I had that one in here, I got 15 eggs. Then, sorry, I'm just reading the note. Um, how 
want to know, there's been a patient who's had a change in egg quality. Um, I don't, uh, it's hard to know unless I see the, the embryology sheet. Um, there, is, there is evidence for CoQ10 or ubiquinol. Um, there is a randomized controlled trial that used it for six weeks and there was a trend towards improved egg quality. They had to, to cut this trial short because they had a problem with their polar body biopsy technique. So it could be one of those things that impacted egg quality. Um, okay. Um, all right. I think that's probably it. Um, that's good news, Elsie. Good to hear that. That's really good news. All right. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I might sign off now. I'm locate. My practice is located at uh, two, at Watkins Medical Center uh, on two two five Wickham Terrace. Um, and if you wanted more information uh, or to get in touch, you could call the Queens QFG Queensland Fertility Group one eight hundred number. Okay, good night everyone. Thanks for listening.